Hey, I'm Mitchell Holmes and I am the children's director at our Waterford location. Thank you so much for checking out this message. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way that you can do that is by texting the word River Connect to 97000. That's River Connect, all one word, to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you'd like to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click on the giving tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. So, as I said this morning, we're continuing in our series in the Sermon on the Mount. We've looked at the Lord's Prayer. We've looked at Jesus' words on, on fasting. We've looked at how to pray. So many of these things. And I think there's really been two themes that I've seen woven throughout the whole thing that really Pastor Josh has kind of drawn out from the text. And in the two main things, number one is the importance of prayer and how to pray. But then right hand in hand, even with, with that, is the difference between the public and the private life of the believer. How there's, there's, there's certain parts of prayer and, and spiritual disciplines that must be done in private, but then they then affect um, really our public life. And we're going to continue in that this morning by looking at something that um, has to do with both the public and the private life. Here, I want to talk this morning about anxiety. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, we'll open our, our Bibles in just a second here, but where he's talking about anxiety, he's going to tell us over and over, five times in the text today, he's going to say, do not be anxious. And this morning, where we're going to go with that, I'm just going to, right off the bat, we're going to look at the six reasons that Jesus gives why he tells us not to be anxious. We're going to see, ultimately, the connection between the previous scriptures and, and now, um, and we're going to see why Jesus gives us the reasoning for why not only do we not have to be anxious, but he calls his followers not to be anxious. So today, I think, you know, anxiety is a much more common term today than even a couple years ago, or, or 10, 15, 20, even 30 years ago. But anxiety is something that's so prevalent in our society. Almost 20% of American adults have been diagnosed with some sort of anxiety disorder. Almost 50% of people between the ages of 18 and 24 report a depressive disorder or anxiety symptoms. 50% of people ages 18 to 24. <clears throat> It's something that everybody deals with in, in some capacity. We see it just you know, infiltrating our teenagers, our, our young adults, but it doesn't stop there just when you become uh, what a full-grown adult. I don't know what you call it after you're a young adult, an old adult or something. But all that to say, we, Jesus' words are ultimately so needed here. They're so pointed to our culture today. And so if you grab your Bibles, uh, you can follow along on the screens or in the River Church app. We'll be in Matthew chapter 6. Pick it up uh, in verse 25. We're going to look back at verse 24 just for a moment. I want to see what Jesus has to say about this. And he's speaking at this time to a culture that... They didn't know where oftentimes their next meal was going to come from. Their clothing, they didn't have closets and closets like we did. Jesus' words here regarding food and clothing, he's really talking to their daily needs here. He's speaking to those things. So let's uh, begin reading here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And then after we read 25, we're going to jump back to verse 24 here. So Matthew 6, 25. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Jesus begins really with the first word in verse 25. He says, therefore. He's pointing back to everything that has been said, this theme of prayer, this theme of the, the public life versus the private life. But I think verse 24 summarizes the previous section that Josh uh, that we talked about last week, verse 24 says, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The word here for, for money, I don't think it specifically just means only money. It can really mean 
uh, things. It can mean our possessions. It's the word that uh, the Greek people used for their God of material things, their, their God of their possessions, mammon here, their things. And so this idea that you can't serve both the Lord and things, possessions, material things, the, the treasures of this earth, as we saw last week here. It's really this idea to kind of summarize the previous section, if God is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. If he's not Lord of everything, he's not your sole master, he's not your Lord at all. And so as we kind of move on here to anxiety, we have to keep in mind that the person who is seeking the things of this earth, the person who's seeking to to build up treasure on this earth is going to have anxiety because they're going to be constantly trying to measure up. To, to accumulate more. They're never, there's never going to have enough. And so Jesus, kind of after making clear the call for believers to build up treasures in heaven, with that in mind, then we move on to verse 25 here. Therefore, do not be anxious about your life. It's really easy. You know, just don't ever be anxious about it. I, w- I want to spend just a minute looking at what Jesus means by this. Five times in the next nine verses that we're going to be studying, Jesus says, do not be anxious. That's the point of exactly where we're going to go today. It's not fancy. Jesus made it really simple. So we're going to keep it really simple today. And so what does Jesus mean when he says, do not be anxious? So uh, this word translated, do not be anxious here, it's the verb form of a Greek word, men, minimenau. It's kind of a weird word here, but here it's translated anxious. It means to be anxious, kind of just simply. It means to be concerned about something, or it's sometimes also translated in a way of caring for one another. You're you're anxious about someone because you care about them. So Luke 10, verse 41, we see the same word. And um, the Lord, Jesus answers the story of Mary and Martha here. Luke 10, 41, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Martha was anxious, probably not in a positive sense here, about doing things for the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32, Paul's writing. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. So he says, Ultimately, he's he's saying how singleness is better than to be married. But not everybody can do that. But he says singleness is really a benefit for the believer because that person is anxious about the things of the Lord. Now, that's not a negative anxiety. That's a positive thing. That person is is passionate about, they care about the things of the Lord here. Philippians chapter 4, the same word. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Probably a bit of a more negative anxiety here. Don't be anxious about anything, but instead of that, bring it to the Lord. Now, we also see it translated here, uh, concerned. So Paul, in an admirable, admirable sense here, speaking of Timothy, in, first, uh, in Philippians 2.20, pardon me, he says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. It's the same Greek word here, but, but this is a positive sense. Timothy is concerned about the church in Philippi. He cares deeply about them. It's this positive concern, anxiety here. And then lastly, we see it translated in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 as care, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. It's the same idea here of this anxiety, this care, this concern here. And then Paul specifically uses a slightly different form of the same word, but in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, apart from other things, there is daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So we see that Paul had some sort of this anxiety. Now his anxiety here, we can assume is probably a positive anxiety that he cares deeply about the church here. So I think there's two conclusions to draw as we kind of take all of this together to kind of build this foundation of what anxiety is and is not here. The first thing is that not all anxiety, and the word used for anxiety is bad. I think, I think a better word to help us understand it today is this idea of, of concern. 
You care about someone and something. The second thing here is that the call of do not be anxious is not a call for a who cares attitude. It's not like Jesus is just telling his followers, you know, don't be anxious in the sense that like, you just don't think, don't let anything affect you, just go through life without having any cares in the world. No, that's, that's not what Jesus is saying either. Kent Hughes puts it really well. He says, some concern is good, but Jesus is counseling us against worry that is self-centered and has at its root a lack of trust in God. And so the type of anxiety that Jesus is saying, do not be anxious, is this. It's worry that is inward focused, that's self-centered here and is rooted with a lack of a trust in the Lord. You know, I, I, find, I found myself there often. I've been there. I felt that. But I, I also just want a, a bit of a disclaimer here as well. I don't want to just discredit anxiety as a whole. As we saw, 20% of adults, so statistically in this room, 20% of you are, have been diagnosed with some sort of an anxiety disorder. And I've, I've been there. You know, I spent about three years my early young adult years, from about eight, when I was about 18, 19, 20, those years, I, I dealt with really bad anxiety. <clears throat> uh, there were times in my life I can vividly remember being in rooms, and it oftentimes got worse, the worst, when I was alone. I'd be in a room, and I'd just be doing something. I might be try, thinking about something, whatever it might be, and I would just begin to suffer from an anxiety attack. And for me, this isn't what it is for everybody, but for me, I would be sitting down usually, or I, or I had to sit down, and the, the room would just start to kind of spin. And I would do nothing to bring it on myself, but then I felt like everything I was scared of in the world would come racing at me at the same time. Like I, I like saw things, not like hallucinations, but like it was just like the room would get dark, kind of into like, just like see very clearly out, but nothing else. And then everything was just racing at me. My, my heart would start racing. My, my mind would start racing. And then I would just try and pray. I would try and do everything I could, but yet it, it just kind of had to allow it to pass. So I want to leave room for that this morning. I, I want to say that there's a place for mental health. There's a place. If, if that's you, please see a counselor, please talk about it with somebody. I don't want you to take this as just like, well, I need to stop doing that. Now, I do hope this morning that we're going to see a little bit of the root of it uh, in, a, in a lot of times in anxiety, but I also want to talk a little bit more about this worry and concern side as opposed to the, the mental health, the anxiety disorder. And I can relate to that as well, you know, the, the, the worry and the concern side. I'm, I'm naturally a worrier. Uh, I don't know if, you know, Josh knew this when he asked me to preach this week, but I'm, I'm a worrier. I, I think my mind races, but I like to disguise it as overthinking. Or I like to, you know, say, I'm just stressed right now. Or, or for me, you know, it's, it's just a season I got I to gotta get through. But to help us understand really the difference here, I want to I put a little bit of a lang language to it. I want to talk about virtuous concern, which is a, a healthy concern that we've read about from Paul. Virtuous concern, that's the positive sense, caring deeply about somebody. But then the negative that Jesus is warning against here, we're going to call sinful anxiety. The sinful anxiety that we need to be weary of, again, just to help us understand it, Matthew Henry puts it well. He says, the thought here that is forbidden is a disquieting, a tormenting thought, which hurries the mind hither and thither. You can tell he was, you know, wrote in the 1800s. We don't talk that way anymore. But it hangs the mind in suspense, which disturbs our joy in God, and is a damp upon our hope in him, which breaks the sleep and hinders our enjoyment of ourselves, of our friends, and of what God has given us. It's a distrustful, unbelieving thought. That's the anxiety we're talking about this morning. And so Jesus says that type of concern, anxiety, worry. Jesus says in verse 25, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is life, not more than food. Right off the bat, the first reason that Jesus gives for his followers not to be anxious because your life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. I think when we get that twisted, it tends to lead to anxiety 
in our lives. For some people, those who, kind of pointing back to last week, who store up treasures here on this life, on this earth, their life is not more than their food and clothing, their, their things, their possessions. But Jesus is reminding his listeners, kind of right off the bat here, that there's more to life than what we consume and what we put on, what we wear here. But for some people, their livelihood is more important than their life. It's a sad place to be, wanting more, trying to keep the facade up, keeping their lifestyle up, whatever that might be. And Jesus says to that person and to all of us ultimately that our life is more than our livelihood. Our life is not about the things we put on and the things that we can get. First example why Jesus says we don't have to be anxious. He says our life is not about that. And then he gives us a picture of this. Love what he says in verse 26. He's going to teach us from the birds. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus gives, he says, look at the birds. He says, why, why would you be anxious? Look at the birds. They don't sow, they don't reap, <clears throat> they don't store up in storehouses and barns, but yet your heavenly Father provides for them. But I think it's the example of the birds is, also makes it clear that the call for do not be anxious is not a call to just sit around idly. You know, I can't leave the house because I don't want to sin or, you know, I, I, I can't ever think to the future because it may, no, it's not what Jesus is saying here. We look at the example of the birds and the birds, they plan. They look towards the future. They build nests. They, they, they do what they can a little bit to prepare, but yet also they live day by day here. The birds, they don't worry. They don't fret about where their next meal is going to come from, and yet still the Lord provides for them. And yet, as humans, we are so much more valuable than the birds. If God provides for the birds, how much more willing is he to provide for those who bear his image? Each one of us is, how much more is he going to provide for humans? It's this idea of, it's really a traditional Jewish reasoning here uh, that, that Jesus is using, where he starts with the lesser, the birds. And he says, the Lord provides for them. Look at them. They don't worry. They don't fret. When you're greater than them, so going from the lesser to the greater here, well, then how much more is the Lord going to provide for you? How much more does he care for you? And so we don't, we don't have to be anxious because if the Lord provides for the birds, he will provide for us that are of way more value than them. And then in verse 27, Jesus gives us our next reason here <clears throat> for why not to worry. He says, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? Jesus, again, kind of pointing to our rationale, our reasoning here. <clears throat> He says, which of you by being anxious can add an hour to his lifespan? You feel like you can't get enough done, so you're going to worry, but that doesn't give you more time. It doesn't do anything. You can't add time to your life. It doesn't change things, but worry, for me at least, it just keeps me spinning. I'm stuck in this cycle that I feel like I can't get out of. And ultimately, worry tends to shorten our life. The science Shows that, that worrying, it, you know, it, it has a negative effect on our lives. So the third reason why Jesus says not to worry, he says anxiety has little to no benefit. It's not going to help us in the moment or, or benefit, us, benefit us here, there. But yet, we tend to think, and where I tend to find myself is that, well, I, I, I have to worry. I, I, I got to do something about this. I can't just let it be. But yet the call of the Lord is to let it be. To not worry. We're going to see in a little bit how he doesn't need us to worry. So as we continue kind of here, we're going to see not only why not to worry, but why we don't have to worry here. The next example that Jesus gives in verse 28, he says, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Jesus, he says, why, the next thing here, why are you anxious about your clothing? When he says, why are you anxious, he's saying, do not be anxious about your clothing here. 
The second picture that Jesus paints to help us understand this and really to his listeners then and now is the, is the, the field. You know, just a, a common field, but then the lilies that line it. He says, consider the lilies here. The NIV translates it, see how the lilies of the field. Or, yeah, see how uh, the lilies of the field, how they grow. But I think really to kind of take it literally here, Jesus is telling us to learn carefully from the lilies. So he's telling us to learn from the flowers of the field. It's like a weird thing to learn from. He says they don't toil or they, they don't spin. They don't labor. They don't work. The fields don't, but yet the Lord provides for them, and he ultimately dresses them. And I know to toil and spin, that's what it means literally, but when I think of my worry, my anxiety, I think toiling and spinning is often how I feel. Like I'm just twiddling my thumbs like I'm just spinning in a circle in my mind, going over the same things, and you know, oh, if I don't do that, who's gonna do it? Oh, and I forgot, and oh my gosh, I didn't do this, and like I'm just like stuck in this. I'm just like toiling and trying to do something about it, but standing still all at the same time. Or just even trying to distract myself from something at the same way. Working aimlessly, and ultimately just wasting that time. But the, I remember the first time I understood this, the, the beautiful picture of the lilies in the field. So uh, back in August of 20, oh boy, 18, I think it was, my wife Haley and I had, had just started dating a couple months. Well, we'd been dating, I don't know, nine, eight, nine months at that point. And we took a trip to Colorado for the first time. Much of her family is out there. And we spent uh, the weekend camping up in the mountains, and it was beautiful. And on our drive down through the mountains, we went through some, some pass. I don't know what it was. I just, you know, some, some pass high up in the mountains. And I remember driving, and I just saw this picture. I want to I wanna show you real quick. I just remember seeing this. And I asked her brother, Haley's brother, who was driving the car, like, to pull over the car. It was my first time to Colorado. And I'm not kidding, every single place we went, I said, this is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my whole life. They started mocking me, like, you wanna go see another most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your whole life? But I saw this, and I just remember, like, we stop the car, cars on the other side of the street, we get out, we walk across, and I'm just looking. And I remember seeing the fields in the lake, in the lilies over here, they're not literally lilies, but Jesus isn't talking just about the lilies, he's really just talking about flowers in general. And thinking how this field with, with a lake in the middle of it, how the Lord did that. The Lord dressed that. It's not like somebody went around and planted those flowers and planted those trees. No, the Lord did that. He dressed that field. He dressed that. And yet he says, if I can do that for ultimately, he says, um, God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? How much more does he care about us than he does a field? That he will clothe and provide for us. You know, it's not because the field worked for it or because the field deserved that, but it's because of the Lord's care of that simple field of his creation, but then also his power to do something about it. So ultimately, the fourth reason why Jesus says not to worry, because God dresses the field and you are much more valuable than them. If he plants the beautiful flowers there, how much more will he dress and provide for his people? His creation, which bears his image and his value beyond that. He's still going from the lesser to the greater here. So if God clothes the fields which are short-lived, the grass that'll be burnt up, it's temporal, how much more does he care about you and will provide your needs, your clothes, what you need each and every single day? But yet we forget that. Move on, we get so caught up in what we have to do, in the striving, what we did do and what we didn't do, 
and forget the Lord's care for us and his power to provide. The warning that Jesus gives next sound a little bit harsh, but I think, I mean, not I think, I know that he knows what he's saying here at the end of verse 30. He says, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now, you might be sitting here, and the whole time, you're like anxiety, worry, concern, that's, that's a feeling. It's not like I can just shut it off, but it's something I, I feel. And it is. Anxiety is an emotion. But Jesus says that our anxiety, our worry, our concern, it comes down to our faith. It comes down to our faith in his care and his power ultimately. The good news is that God cares. And that's good. That's a really good first start to care about something or someone but it's not action. But concern can motivate action. And the thing about the Lord's care for his people, for his creation, is that he doesn't just care from a distance. It's not like he just cares and leaves it there. No, he also has the power to take action. You know, it's not like the Lord sees us and sees our needs and he's like, well, I hope they figure it out. You know, we're like, we tend to say, like, I'm really pulling for you. Like, that doesn't do any good. Come on now, right? Like, you say you're pulling for somebody, like, good thoughts, good, I, I, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. But the Lord doesn't leave us there because he has come near to us. He sees our creation. He, he knows our need. And yet, ultimately, we have, now we're able to look back upon the life of Jesus Christ. We have this human, not this human. We have the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this earth 2,000 years ago, who took on human form, who being fully God and fully human, he set aside his deity to experience the full human life. He knows exactly what we need day in and day out. He's lived this life. He knows our worry and our concern over things. He knows the temptation to sin. He knows it all. But he didn't leave us there. He didn't just come and experience and do nothing about it. No, Jesus took the penalty for our sin. Sometimes our sinful anxiety, our self-centeredness, our sin that has separated all of us from the Lord, he took that on himself. He went from concern to action. And Jesus on the cross, took the penalty and the weight and the consequences of every single one of our sins that separate us from him. And then he died, the death that we deserve for our sin, the death that we deserve for our wrongdoing. And three days later, he rose again. Again, he took action to show that he's stronger than sin and death. He's stronger than the evil one. He appeared to a couple thousand people. He, he ascended, he went back up to be with the Father, and he shares that with us. Just never want to miss an opportunity that if you've never repented of your sin and turned of it and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, I'm, I'm going to be honest that your life is going to be filled with anxiety and worry because you're measuring up. You're wondering, have I done enough? Has my good outweighed my bad? Have I done enough to make God happy? But that's not how we're saved. Romans 10, 9 is really simple. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the prayer that you pray. It's not a, a repeat after me thing, but it's that prayer. And if you've never done that, the promises of Jesus Christ are waiting for you. I want to encourage you to pray that prayer, to turn of your sin, confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, to put aside the earthly <clears throat> treasures and the temptations, and to begin to build a, a heavenly a place in heaven and ultimately our heavenly reward. And Jesus says that, and he's given us a chance to be free from our sin. <clears throat> so what do we do from there, though? Whether you've made that decision now or if you've made that decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord, 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever it might be, if our faith is what's lacking, what do we do about that? Because I've oftentimes heard this misused in regarding mental health. Well, you just need to have more faith. And they leave it there. Like, like faith is something that we conjure up. Like this happened because you didn't have enough faith. Well, it's, it's on you. No, Jesus is giving the warning. He says, oftentimes our faith does lead to anxiety. Not always, but I believe it is a big factor in it. What do we do? Love uh, what Paul says in Romans 10, 17. He kind of traces it back here. If we're going to trace worry back to our faith, he says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So we trace worry back to faith. We're going to trace faith back to meditating on the word of God. And so when we find ourselves anxious, we find ourselves worrying and concerned, in a self-centered sense, not a care about others, but ultimately inwardly pointing, what am I going to do about it? Have I done enough? You know, thinking that we can do something about it. I think we have to ask ourselves this question. Do I care? Do I believe that God cares and he's all powerful to change that situation? Now, he showed his care and his power through sending his son, Jesus Christ, and him defeating death and sin, but yet he also shows it in our daily lives here. And I think when we worry and we're anxious, we're lacking either the trust in God's care or in his provision, that he's all-powerful, that he can do something about it. So I just want to ask you, and for you to consider, do you believe that the Lord cares and that he's all-powerful? that he will provide, that he can and he will. So how do we increase this faith? By meditating on the word of the Lord. By replacing our sinful thoughts with the holy word of God. By meditating on it, by praying and asking for faith, by hiding his word in our heart. As Psalm 119.11 says, I've stirred up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, how do we have faith? By, by having his word, by hiding it in our heart, by feeding on it daily, day in and day out, by beginning our day in his word and in prayer and asking the Lord, Lord, give me faith to believe that you can do this. Give me faith to believe that you care and you will provide for me. And Jesus gives us another action step here. Verse 31, got to find it here. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. The Gentiles here is just really pointing at non-believers here saying non-believers, they, they're concerned about these things. They want to build up their livelihood. They're concerned about these types of things, but yet your, if, you're, if your citizenship is in heaven, you're a follower of the Lord, that's not our priority. Not living for the here and now, but yet oftentimes we do that. We live in the here and now. But we can know and believe, it's the key at the end of verse 32 here, Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Our heavenly Father knows what we need. The difference between the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, is that they don't have a heavenly father, but we do. We have a good, loving, caring father, who if he cares for those things, how much more does he care for us? He's not distant and unaware. Rather, he's near and very in tune. He's experienced our needs. He knows our needs, and he sees our needs. When we forget these things, it oftentimes leads to worry and anxiety. So what do we do with these concerns? We bring them to him in prayer. We cast our cares upon him. Cast them on him, believing that he can change them. When we just find ourselves spinning, well, we'll just bring them to the one that can actually do something about it. We bring them to him in prayer. 
So the fifth reason why we don't have to be anxious is because our heavenly Father knows our need. I think a beautiful example of this is a man named George Mueller. You might have heard of him. He's a Christian evangelist, director of orphanages in the 1800s in England. He was a man who really is known for his reliance upon the Lord for provision and his prayer life. Instead of um, finding supporters for his orphanages in the traditional way, he took the word of the Lord very literally. He fully re- relied upon prayer and the Lord to meet his needs. There's stories upon stories of him asking for the Lord, asking the Lord for something and the Lord providing it. Instead of enlisting the people around him, which isn't a bad thing, he felt the call of the Lord to take this literally. And instead of advertising their needs, he would bring them to the Lord in prayer. One example of this is uh, one, one night he was heading to bed and he realized there was no food for the, or, for the orphans for, for breakfast the next morning. And so he brings it to the Lord in prayer. And I, I have to believe that it's not like a, Lord, you know our need, you know, like just stop. I, I believe he's like laboring in prayer before the Lord, petitioning the Lord, saying, Lord, would you do this? I know that you can. I believe that you care. You see our need. Would you provide for us? So he prays many hours into the night. That morning, as the the children were gathered for prayer before breakfast, a local baker knocks on the door and says, I I felt the conviction of the Lord. I couldn't sleep. I baked a bunch of bread for for the kids. Here you go. It's like, okay, that's cool. The Lord answered that prayer. Not a couple minutes later, the local milkman knocks on the door. His milk cart had broken down in front of the the orphanage. His the milk was going to go bad. And he says, take, take this. And the Lord provides for them. There, there's stories of, of George Mueller taking a, a, a need, a, a bill, a financial bill that was due soon to the Lord in prayer. That morning, somebody showing up, dropping an envelope under the door with the exact amount of that bill needed to provide for it. Stories upon stories of people being compelled by the Holy Spirit to meet the needs of those around them. All the while, George Mueller, not making this public, but keeping it private, bringing his needs and the orphanage's needs to the Lord and trusting and believing that the Lord will provide. And I think there's, there's kind of two takeaways for us here. It's this idea that, number one, his treasure, George Mueller's treasure, was not here on this earth. He was not trying to make a name for himself or the orphans, advertising their needs and the good they were doing. No, he was looking to the next life by meeting the needs those that the Lord called him to in this life. And then secondly, by trusting and believing that the Lord cares about their needs and the Lord will provide for their needs. He really exemplified verse 33 here, where Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. <clears throat> Instead of being anxious, what do we do? We, we seek first the kingdom of the Lord. To, to seek something is, is a careful concern and really an earnest endeavor for it. You, can, you're, you care about it, and you're doing something about it. You seek the kingdom of the Lord first. I believe we take that literally in the sense that we're to seek the Lord first. Our waking moments with the Lord this is something I, I'm not good at, but continuing to work at. All right off the bat, beginning our day in his word and seeking his will, seek the face of the Lord We also seek him first in response to anxiety, concern, worry, a trouble, confusion, whatever that might be. And we're also about the things that he is about. We meet the needs of those around us. We spread the gospel to those around us. And Jesus says, as you seek his kingdom first, all these things will be added to you. It's a story of George Mueller. The Lord added their needs, provided for their needs because they were about things that he is about. And lastly, here with the seek about the seeking first the kingdom, it's not a priority that we add to our list of priorities, but seeking first the kingdom of God begins the day and then infiltrates every priority of ours by doing all things in a way that honors the Lord and doing the things that He is about. And lastly, to conclude here, Jesus says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So again, therefore, 
taking everything in mind, the call to not be anxious, remembering the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, remembering our heavenly Father, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The day will be anxious for itself. Now, the last reason here, God doesn't need our help being anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't need our help being anxious about it. There's going to be things that cause us anxiety and worry each and every single day. There will be trouble, Jesus warns us. But we need not worry about them before they happen. Leave them to the Lord since he knows about them and he can be trusted to deal with it. The call of Christ is to live in today, the now, the present, not looking forward to tomorrow with worry and fret, to trust that our Heavenly Father knows our needs, that He sees our needs, He cares about them, and He will provide for our needs. And when we live there, when we seek first the things of God and allow Him to work out the rest, it's really this breath of fresh air enables us to be present here and now so our worry does no good. Worry will not destroy tomorrow's trials, but it will sabotage our strength. George MacDonald put it this way, no man ever sank under the burden of the day, but it is when tomorrow's burden is added to the burden of today that the weight is more than a man can bear. Have you ever been there? We're not only adding tomorrow's weight and next week's weight and, and next month's weight. No, the call is to live today, to not worry and fret, to trust the Lord. Jesus' command isn't that we're not to plan. It's not that we just fly by the seat of our pants. No, we're to plan well so that we don't have to worry, but then we rely on the Lord to provide each and every single day. Provide food, provide clothing, provide everything else that we need over and above that, to begin to be busy about the things the Lord is about. So we begin our day with the Lord by entrusting it to Him, asking Him to provide for our needs. And then ultimately, I think one of the best practices that we can do is then to end our day with the Lord. There's this, this prayer structure that, that we've been, we talked about as with the young adults a couple weeks ago that I've been trying to place in my life that has been helpful because I'm a worrier. I'm an anxious person. It's, this, it's called the examine. There's four steps to it that we're called to do. At the, not that we're called, but it's, it's one way to pray that helps me unwind at the end of the day. It helps me to reflect upon the Lord and to not get too hurried into tomorrow. So the first step is you review in your day, when did you feel close to the Lord and when did you feel distant? Second step, you remember. Thank the Lord for today's gifts. How did he provide today? Third step, repent your sin. Where did you fall short? Then lastly, to request. What do you need from God tomorrow? You look ahead as you're winding down as you're heading to sleep. Lord, what do I need tomorrow? Not the next day and the next day, but to live in the here and now, to trust, to believe that the Lord cares, and the Lord will provide. And as we do that, Jesus says, as we work towards that, we'll be less anxious, we'll be about the things that he is about. That's the call of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that even when we feel like there's more going on than we can handle. We feel like there's more than we're even seeing, Lord. You're not overwhelmed. Lord, you're not anxious, but you're fully in control. Lord, you see, you know. So I just ask, Lord, that we would be a people who take it one day at a time. Lord, and as we ask for our daily bread, would you continue to provide for it? Lord, would we be able to be busy about the things that you care about? We seek your kingdom first and your will. Quiet our hearts and our minds. Pray this in the precious, the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.